Neuro architecture. You've heard the term, but what is it really? Today, we're cutting through the noise and having a clear look at what neuro architecture really is and how we can quietly transform the way we live and the way we design. Welcome to the Household Podcast, your go to space where design, cognitive sciences, well being, and business come together. I'm your host, Monica Costa, and today you're tuning into a neurodesign capsule, an exploration into how the spaces we dwell in can engage our senses, shape our thoughts, and quietly guide our behavior. This podcast is powered by Houses, born from its mission to guide designers on how to create spaces for well being grounded in cognitive sciences principles. Let's dive in. drawn to people, to understanding what well-being really means for each person and how space can support that in ways that we don't always realize. Back during the pandemic, I was doing a lot of e-design, sending floor plans, furniture layouts, mood boards, but honestly, most clients just did their own thing with it. And at that time, I actually thought that that was normal. And I believed that my job was just to make things look good. But then I worked with a close friend, someone I had known forever. And for the first time, I saw what it meant to design for someone you truly know. She didn't just follow the design because I, her friend, had made it. She followed it because it felt like her. And let me tell you, that moment flipped a switch on me. I realized I wasn't designing for people and I was actually designing around them. So I started digging into design psychology, human behavior, the nervous system, and eventually I landed on neuroarchitecture. And here's the thing, what I thought neuroarchitecture was, it wasn't. And what most people think it is, that's not quite right either. So today I'm here to clear the noise around this word that gets thrown around too loosely sometimes. And to also help you understand what this discipline really is where its limits are, and how far it can actually take us. So let me ask you, what is neuroarchitecture really? Is it neuroscience applied to space? Is it a way to hack our brain with design? Is it just a buzzword people throw around to sound scientific? Or is it something deeper, something that could actually reshape how we design for the real human experience and well-being? Can a space really influence your nervous system, your memory, your stress levels? And most importantly, as designers, how far can we actually go with it? Where does the science end and the speculation begin? And I'm not here to add more hype to this conversation, but to clarify it, to name what neuroarchitecture is, what it isn't, and what it can be when we approach it with respect, with evidence, and with the real people in mind. So let's start from the beginning. Neuroarchitecture is a scientific discipline. This means it's not a style, it's not a design trend, and it's not about having curved walls or using beige tones to calm people down, and that's it. This scientific discipline actually merges architecture with neuroscience to study how the built environment affects the human brain emotionally, physiologically, and cognitively. And this is not about the vibes or your instinct. It's about the nervous system and measurable impact. Now, the term itself, neuroarchitecture, emerged formally in the early 2000s, when the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, known as ANFA, was founded in San Diego, California, in the United States, through a partnership between architects and neuroscientists. And their goal was to build a bridge between what designers intuit and what scientists can actually measure. Because let's be honest, we spend more than 90% of our lives indoors. And for decades, very few people were asking how those environments might be shaping our nervous systems. Things like low ceiling heights affecting perception or how lighting changes emotional tone or even how spatial layouts supports or blocks memory retention or creative thinking. Your architecture came to fill that gap, to bridge those two worlds. Now, let's name the obvious here. Most of us designers are not neuroscientists. So no, we're not expected to run fMRI studies or build labs with biosensors. 
That's not the point. Even though if you wanted to, it's a possibility and there's a process that you would have to go through for that. But what really matters is that we begin to understand what the science is actually telling us, where our role begins and where it ends, and how we can collaborate with other disciplines to design more intentionally and more humanely. Now, remember when I said that neuroarchitecture is a scientific discipline? Well, that means there are researchers who study this full time. And when they do, they mainly use two key tools. The first one is what we call environmental simulation. This means building a space virtually and then testing one variable at a time, like lighting or the ceiling height or spatial density while holding everything else constant. This allows them to see how that one specific element might influence how someone feels or performs in that environment. And that is slow work because these studies take months and sometimes years, but they give us incredibly valuable insights about what actually impacts the nervous system. Now, the second method is called neurophysiological measurements. And that's where it gets even more fascinating because when you ask people how a space makes them feel, you get conscious answers, right? But our bodies pick up on subtle cues before we can even explain them. So researchers use tools like EEGs for brainwave or heart rate monitors or galvanic skin response sensors. So what we call biosensors to understand how people react beneath the surface. And that matters because sometimes the way a space affects us is quiet. It's invisible. It's happening in our breath, in our heartbeat, or the tension that we carry without even noticing, and even our sweat. That's what this science is trying to make visible. But if we're being honest, this kind of research takes resources, teams, time, and most designers won't be running these studies themselves. And we shouldn't feel like we have to either. However, that doesn't mean that we're left out because there are two main ways that we can apply this work right now. The first one is called evidence-based design. It's exactly what it sounds like. You take the research that already exists, so the evidence that researchers have already tested in labs or healthcare settings or even classrooms, and then you let that guide your design decisions. Things like the effect of daylight on alertness or how views of nature can support your recovery, or even how layout impacts your stress levels. So no, it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's basically about just actually using what science has given us through years of research and using that in our design process. So instead of designing in a vacuum or just going off instinct, we can design with evidence by our side. And then we have the second path, which is, in essence, a little more complex. It's called experimental neuroarchitecture. It usually happens in collaboration with researchers, neuroscientists, designers, psychologists, so mainly multidisciplinary teams that can build simulations, control environments, and actually measure what's happening in the nervous system as the people experience the space. Things like heart rate, brain activity, or even micro behaviors that reveal how safe or alert someone feels in a room. It's lower, more technical, and yes, it requires more support, but it's also growing. There are universities and studios all over the world working on this now. And the more we stay connected to that work, even just by staying curious or following what's being published, the more that we can bring those insights into our projects even if we're not running the studies ourselves. And well, now that we've laid the groundwork, let's clear the air on a few more things. Because now we know what neuroarchitecture really is, but let's see what it's not. Because I've heard it all. And if you've been on Pinterest or seen articles casually throwing around the word neuroarchitecture, chances are, so have you. So let's walk through a few common myths that I have heard around there, gently but directly. The first one being neuroarchitecture is basically feng shui with a science label. Well, this one comes up a lot and I want to clarify it with care because many traditional systems like feng shui or vashtu zastra or even indigenous spatial practices have long acknowledged something that science is only beginning to measure, that our environment affects us. 
The difference is neuroarchitecture comes from a scientific lens. It studies how specific elements in space, like lighting, forms, acoustics, layouts, affect the nervous system using measurable physiological data. So things like heart rate variability, brainwave patterns, or stress biomarkers. So while they do come from different worldviews, both approaches recognize that space is not neutral. They both care about how humans feel in space. They just approach it with different languages, timelines, and tools. Feng Shui is rooted in ancient cultural wisdom and neuroarchitecture in contemporary neuroscience. They're not the same and they're not competing. They're just speaking different languages to describe that spaces matter more than we think. Now, myth number two will be it's just common sense rebranded. And I get this question all the time. Isn't it just good design? And well, sure, sometimes what neuroscience tells us aligns with what great designers have already sensed or are already doing. But sensing something is not enough. Neuroarchitecture brings the value of evidence like studies showing that higher ceilings activate more abstract thinking or that natural light and spatial layout influence cortisol and heart rate recovery. So no, it's not just good design. It's informed design. It's how we shift the does this look good question for the what's this doing to the user's nervous system question or how this light or layout or material actually affects the way the user feels in this space question. And that makes our work go from intuitive and just good design to intentional and evidence-based. Myth number three, if I'm using biophilic design, sensory elements, calming colors, or natural light, I'm already doing neuroarchitecture. Well, it's a common assumption because yes, these approaches do overlap. But here's the difference. While biophilic design and sensory design focus on how a space feels, neuroarchitecture asks what it's doing to the brain and the body. And how can we measure that? For example, plants might make a space feel calming, but neuroarchitecture looks at what kind of greenery, spatial rhythm, or light intensity actually lowers cortisol or supports attention networks. And yes, natural light and color matter, but it's not just about brightness or hue. Too much unfiltered light can cause fatigue. Color impacts focus and arousal, but depends on the context and the user profile. So if you're already working this way, amazing, but your architecture helps take your intuition and turn it into evidence. So your design doesn't just feel right, it actually works physiologically and neurologically. Now, myth number four. We can use neuroscience to predict exactly how someone will feel in a space. Well, this last one is one of the biggest misconceptions, probably because neuroscience sounds precise, almost mathematical. And while it's true that research can tell us, for example, how certain spatial elements are linked to increased attention or reduced stress, it's a mistake to think that we can design a space that guarantees the same response for every person. Because at the end of the day, we're working with people and people are complex. So no, neuroarchitecture cannot predict your mood down to the decimal. But what it can do is give us patterns, probabilities, and insights. So a much more informed starting point to design from. It gives us clarity to design more responsibly, basically. Of course, there are more, but I'll leave it here for now. And if you've heard a different one or have questions about any of this, drop it in the comments, and I would love to keep the conversation going. And now that we've explored what neuroarchitecture is, and we have cleared up some of the noise around it, I want to pause and ground this conversation in something really, really important. This field is still evolving. And just like anything that touches human experience, it comes with layers, nuances, and real-world limitations. 
The first one being that a lot of the neuroscience that supports this work is based on very specific populations. So what researchers call weird samples, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And what that means is that most of the data that we have collected so far reflects a narrow slice of the human experience. So while we might know how certain lighting conditions improve focus for a 30-year-old office worker in Boston, we don't always know how that same light might affect an elder in Kingston, for example, or a child with sensory sensitivities in Tokyo. The nervous system is universal, yes, but the way we respond to space is also cultural, emotional, and very personal in many ways. Now, another layer to hold gently is that many of the studies in this field happen in lab settings or in digital simulation settings. And while those models are incredibly valuable because they let us isolate variables and understand impact, they're not the same as living inside a real space day in and day out with all the complexities and unpredictability that we have as humans. Emotional memory, interpersonal dynamics, and day-to-day -day variability like grief, tiredness, excitement, or even heartbreak can't be fully replicated in a lab. So while this data is useful, it's only one piece of a much more complex puzzle. And then there's something else that doesn't get talked about a lot, the ethics of influence. If we know, as designers, how a space can nudge behavior or regulate emotion, how far can we actually go? Are we creating environments that support autonomy or ones that manipulate it without consent? These are big questions and they don't have simple answers, but they're worth asking. And finally, this part feels a bit more personal. There's a pressure I see so many designers carry. The belief that if we just follow the science perfectly, we'll get it right. And if we don't, cue the imposter syndrome here because who are we to even talk about this, right? Well, let me tell you, that's not how this works. People are not equations. Spaces are not formulas. And science is always evolving. So neuroarchitecture doesn't ask us to have all the answers. What it's asking us is that we listen more deeply to the data, yes, but also to the people we're designing for that we hold space for nuance, for complexity, for what we know and what we're still learning together. It's about staying in relationship with this science and with the human experience that it's meant to serve. Then it is being perfect. And listen, I know that maybe you hit play on this episode hoping for a step-by-step -step guide or a plug and play method to start applying your architecture right away. And I get it, we do live in a world that loves quick tools and checklists, but this field doesn't quite work like that, at least not if we want to do it well and with real respect for the science behind it. Now, it's true, you don't need a lab or a research team to begin, but you do need curiosity and a willingness to keep asking what your spaces are doing to the people in them. And finally, it needs the courage to shape a process that makes sense, one that honors both the research and your lived design experience. And if that feels like a lot to figure out on your own, that's okay, you don't have to, because some of us have already walked that path, learning by doing, by failing, by adjusting. And now we're here, not with all the answers, but with a map that we have sketched out, ready to share it with anyone who doesn't want to take this path alone. Honestly, the biggest takeaway here is that this field isn't asking you to become a scientist. What it's asking you is to shift your perspective and to become more intentional in your designs. If this episode resonated, feel free to share it with someone who might need a soft entry point to this conversation. Also, follow us so you don't lose any new episode drop every Tuesday. And as always, thank you for being here. Stay well, stay curious, and keep designing your life with intention. See you next time.